Okay, so for those of you who don't know it, this event is being live streamed and you'll receive a link to the video afterwards, correct? Thank so you, you don't have to take notes, you'll get the content. Um, welcome, I'm Amy, I'm the program director at the MIT Enterprise Forum. You're probably all on our email list and you know what's coming up, so uh, I won't make a long intro. I'm going to turn it over to Eileen and Don and Robert and they can take it from here. I'm Eileen Driscoll. Oh, sorry, I get situated <laughs> on the phone. I'm the managing director for supporting strategies here in Boston, and, and my company is experienced in building world-class back offices so that companies can focus on growing their business. And I've been working with startups almost my whole career. So um, when I was in college, I did my internship at IBM, and I said, never again. So. Um, so tonight, what I'd hope to get out of this is to um, talk about how owners should focus on managing their business as opposed to their back office, um, that they'd be able to make information, inf dis good decisions based on the financial information that's provided to them, and develop systems that will grow within the company. Okay, so this is a house. And with the house, I'd like to talk about a little bit of house cleaning that one should do, just basic housekeeping as you start your business. So one of the really important things for companies to do, and it, it you know, it, sometimes a company just starts, right? It's, you know, the old, the old, you know, I'm in my garage and, and I have an idea. But be sure to keep your personal information and your personal financials separate from your professional information. And that, that way you're really starting to track things for the business right from the get-go. Um, open up a business bank account. Um, make sure you get, if you're going to get a credit card or a debit card, separate that. Do one that's different than your personal. Apply for an EIN, which is an employer identification number, so that you have a tax identification for the company. That's important for payroll. It's important when you need to file your tax returns and all other kinds of things that, that you need to do. Um, and then one of the other things as you start, you know, it, it's, it's sometimes it's, you think, oh, there's some things online that, uh, you know, I'll just incorporate online. I'll use LegalZoom or something like that. Um, I think it's a really good idea to hire an attorney. And there's, if you have a good idea and it's something you're, you're going to be investing your meaningful time in, um, there's a lot of attorneys locally here in Boston and other big cities that are willing to make the investment in early stage companies if they feel confident that, um, Either you or your idea is something that's going to have that stickiness. And then also, um, one of the important things to do, just like you, you're doing your networking, is build a base of trusted business advisors. Okay, so now for my first trick question. Okay, this is a trick question, so I do expect a response. Um, so you're a founder. You've got some things on your mind. You've got a, your, your business going. What should a founder really be working on? A, invoicing your customers. B, paying your vendors. Or C, oops, or C, raising capital. Okay? Anyone? Yes, there we go. <laughs> All right. So not really so tricky, but when it comes down to it, a lot of people end up um, spending a lot of time on things that are really not their core competencies. When we think about a founder's core competencies, those are, those are the things that they're, you know, the, the person's really a good developer, they're a good deal maker, they're an innovator, they're able to establish strategic partnerships, things like that. Um, and perhaps the accounting and the bookkeeping that go on behind the scenes is, is really not their strong suit, or they may not do it well, and sometimes the consequences um, can be painful um, down the road if mistakes are made, or if you go to raise money, or your taxes, or things of that things of that nature. But it's not to say there's there's plenty of people that are are competent to do their own stuff, depending upon the you know the stage of growth of your particular company. Um, so I wanted to talk about um, three. 
three particular, <laughs> three particular things in um, success. Consistency, controls, and cash. Um, these are all important concepts for this founder, John, we'll name. John is the founder of um, the software company. And so when we, what, a look at these three C's, consistency, controls, and cash, and kind of drill down on each of them. So consistency, what is consistent company, um, consistent company accounting? What is it? How do you do it? Who does it? And when? So basically, the what is it is there's some things that need to be done almost at every company. So if you have any kind of bills, someone needs to pay the bills. So that's an important thing. Vendors, needs to be, vendors need to be paid. If you have customers, you want to darn make sure that you get the, an invoice in that customer's hand because if you don't give them an invoice, they're not going to pay you or some other means in which to pay you. Um, most companies end up having employees. So the employees need to be paid and they need to be paid appropriately. Um, one of the things that a lot of early stage companies or first time, first time founders learn is there's a lot of issues with payroll taxes that are really important for them to address. The other thing is cash management. Um, some folks will have some friends and family money. So there's a whole um, fiduciary responsibility to once you have other people's money besides just your time involved in something. And so, if you, and you also should be tracking to your budget, um, not only financially, but also your, your, pro, pro, your milestones of your organization. And then financial reporting comes at, as a way for you to get that snapshot of what your business is doing. And then there's other business matters, other decisions that need to be made um, as far as your kind of the what of the three C's of consistency. Um, so what do you do? Um, a company needs to have software, and some there's very, very friendly software out today, and you need to have business processes in place in order to, um, in order to um, capture, you know, fairly capture your things. And we're not talking about anything particularly fancy, but you, you need to have processes. So, so on the consistency, I say how. So I have up here QuickBooks as an example of a way to track. It's a very good product. It has an online functionality, an online product, I should say, that is great for early stage companies. It costs about 30 bucks a month, and you use that. The, the items below there are just ones that our company happens to use, and a lot of, a lot of companies, uh, Bill.com, ADP, Expensify, for the things I talked about. If you, you need to pay your bills, you need to pay your people, and a lot of people put their expenses on their credit card. So these softwares are things that, that you can get in the market that are very friendly to use um, to make sure that you're capturing your information. Oh dear. Okay, so this is a kind of the picture of, of who in a traditional, kind of the old fashioned way of building a company. The old fashioned way of building a company is to hire too many people. And the, the, you know, we, we, need to have a, we need to have a CFO to help us raise the money and help us establish our pricing. We need to have a controller and we need to have a staff accountant and we need to have an HR person and we need to have a bookkeeper and we might even need an office manager as well. Well, really today, um, a lot of companies are using outsourcing for a lot of different functions. And what's really good about outsourcing is it allows that founder of the organization in the right environment um, out, you know, outsourcing depending upon the organization and what it needs to happen. But there's a, a kind of a new look, um, a new look and feel of a lot of companies that say, I want to outsource my IT. I want to outsource my anything about inventory management. I want to outsource my accounting. I want to outsource other things. And so then you have a team that looks like a consulting CFO and there, there's a lot of very talented firms that provide consulting CFOs or part-time CFOs, and also individuals out here in the, in the marketplace that, that work very nicely with accounting firms like Witham, um, like our, our firm does. We, you know, I say we play nicely in the sandbox with, the, um, with the, the CPA firms that are there to do the tax returns and your audit if it comes to having an audit being one of your requirements. Okay, 
So consistency, uh, another C. So what, on uh, consistency, what needs to happen? You need to post your transactions as they occur. So that's those invoices to your customers, your vendor payments, and your cash receipts. Companies, if you have employees, they're gonna wanna get paid. You're gonna record that payroll at the time. Reconcile your balance sheet accounts every month. So that's important because if you don't know how much cash you have um, and you run out, if you're not reconciling, financial statements, a, a good look at the, end of it, at the end of a month to say, what, what does my business look like? Here's a snapshot of my, my balance sheet, my income statement, and my cash flows. And then hopefully you've made a plan and then we'd analyze the results and you compare your budget to your um, key performance indicators. So once you, you have this information in your hand, you're able to make sound business decisions, not on emotions, but on accurate information. Okay, so, and the last on consistency is why. I'll repeat myself, make decisions on reliable financial information. You're gonna need to be, the compliance is everywhere today. Um, for your taxes, you may have an investor, you may have a bank loan, you may have other things that say that you need to comply with someone's, someone's um, your, your industry may, be, may have um, regulations. You might have gotten an SBIR grant. There's all kinds of things that, that you're going to need good solid numbers for in order to comply with. And then in the future, um, if you're planning to have an exit of some sort or an investor, they're going to be looking for good, reliable financial information from you. Okay, on the control side of the house, um, if we look at the, the boxes that I have here up in the upper left, we've got our cash controls. Um, the important thing on cash controls, things like someone's properly approving any disbursements that come out from an organization. Small organizations, it's a little bit tougher to have segregation of duties, but it can, it certainly can happen. If you have one person um, that's actually cutting the checks and there's somebody else in the organization, making sure that they look at the bank statements on a regular basis. Um, that month end close that I talked about is a way to make sure that the cash is going to the right place. Um, documentation, so um, the text posts, we'll probably talk about it, but retaining certain documents is really important when it comes to some of the stuff I talked about earlier, but also for tax tax purposes, back to raising money, and um, and payroll records need to be retained as well. We all know in today's world, data security is very important, and um, whether you're handling personal identifiable information or health information, um, making sure that you have that in place, and then in some instances. Um, you may have an external review or an audit required. Again, it could be a bank requiring it, it could be an investor, it could be, um, it could be you know, a bunch of different things. And then the last one I have um, to talk to you about on my three C's is cash. And cash is in fact the king, and I put a little crown up there so you'll remember that cash is king if you haven't heard that saying before. So a couple of things we'll talk about on the, um, on the cash side of the house. And that's actually managing cash your cash reporting, and your cash forecasting. So on managing cash, one of the really important things as you, as you start to kind of get in that balance of having revenue and your expenses is to understand what your break-even point is. Um, and then focus on your cash flow management itself. Um, maintain some cash reserves. There's nothing, that, no, no, nothing worse than gripping the end of the window, thinking that you're you know, are you gonna make payroll? Are you going to be able to make those payables that are so important to your continued su success? Collecting receivables. Um, stay on top of that. Get, encourage your customers to pay faster. There's a lot of ways to do that in that kind of automated world that we have today. Sometimes, um, sometimes you're able, if, if you like to receive payment by credit card, that can, be, that can be an effective way even though it has a cost to it, but it's a way to get the money in your pocket a little bit faster. There's a lot of times you can set up a relationship with a customer where they're paying by the bank advance to you um, at the time. Sometimes it's a good idea to extend your payables. 
keeping in mind that you want to balance have establishing a good reputation as as someone that's good and trustworthy in doing business, but you can also use technology to your advantage on managing your cash. There's a lot of very good banks today um, that have great online functionality, so take advantage of those. So cash reporting. We talked about reconciliations, and I can't emphasize that enough. I hope that um, that folks are managing, or reconciling their own bank account, uh, their personal bank account. Maybe, maybe not, but I, um, <laughs> if you aren't, um, make sure you reconcile your company's bank account. Um, a cash flash, that's, that's something like a, a, a snapshot into the, into the foreseeable future. A lot of companies will keep a three month cash flash just to see in the short term what's going on, what's coming in, what's coming out. And then also understanding what a statement of cash flow is, in fact. I'm going to, to concentrate on building your business and not so much on you being in charge of your numbers. Make those better business decisions. Count on your financial systems that you can put in place, as I said, that are really, really available to companies today. Um, you can benefit from the team of experienced professionals. And then if you have those procedures and controls in place, they minimize risk. And so I think what we're going to do is save all the questions, if any, until both of us have presented, and then we can jo take joint questions. So thank you. Got the hurdle. Start off by echoing what Eileen just mentioned. Um, the importance of a bookkeeper can't be understated, um, or a part-time CFO. Um, having someone that can support you make financial decisions is really key, um, both for your own business, and then also when you give your financials to a CPA at the end of the year and do your taxes, we also really appreciate it as well. So that's my shameless plug. And with that, we'll kick it off and start talking about taxes. Normally when I say that, everyone runs away. So it's, it's, it's good to see that the response is different this time. Um, so I'm Robert, this is Don, I'm with them as well. Uh, I'll give a little plug about with them, uh, just because you maybe haven't heard of the firm before. Uh, we've been in the Boston marketplace for the last two or three years now. Uh, we're the 26th largest firm in the US, and um, last year we're the, the fastest growing CPA firm. Um, so talk about scaling companies, we definitely feel the um, the growth impact on our own front. Um, we have offices all up and down the eastern seaboard. I've yet to make it to the Cayman Island one. I'm not really sure what that one looks like, but you might imagine. Uh, so today we're going to talk about types of business entities. Um, so you're forming a business, how should you do it? Uh, some tax saving opportunities, some common ones we see, some good ways to save some money. Um, Don's going to talk about equity compensation. Um, you know, Tight on cash, how do you compensate your employees? Uh, some multi-state issues to be aware of as you're scaling your business, um, you're doing activities in other states. What does that mean for you? What are you, you know, liable to? Um, and we'll talk a bit about some of the new tax reform updates. So choice of entity. Um, who here has formed a business or is thinking about forming a business? So you probably went through this process or you started to think about it a little bit. How should you form it? Uh, what are the tax filing implications of how you form it? Um, or can I just keep the business under my name and not go through all this process? So we'll talk about what those different decisions mean to you. Um, and here's a quick illustration of all the different choices you have. So first off is the sole proprietorship. So if I open up a lemonade stand down the street, don't do anything else, that is potentially a sole proprietorship. Um, so there's not a lot it goes into this on the legal standpoint. Everything is the responsibility of the owner. Um, so all the business assets, all the liabilities are all personally responsible to me. And if I die, the business dies with me. Um, you don't need a separate uh, federal identification number, although it's recommended, as Eileen pointed out. Um, and a separate checking account is also very important. 
Um, we still get those clients who commingle everything and it's a total disaster at the end of the year. And if I have a trouble figuring it out, imagine going through an IRS audit at the end of the year and they're trying to figure that out. It's not gonna go well for you, so keep everything separated. Um, some of the advantages, it's very simple. Um, your health insurance, your retirement benefits, very easy to get deductions on those. Uh, there's no formal meeting requirements or state registrations you have to go through. Um, but there's a lot of liability. Um, there's hobby loss rules you want to be aware of. So if I can't show that I'm really in this for the business purposes, any losses I'm incurring aren't going to be deductible. I have to prove that it's a real business. Um, and you get hit with self-employment taxes that are higher than if you were just an employee. Uh, so a partnership. If Don and I decide, hey, we're going to go in business together and we're going to start an accounting firm. And, you know, maybe we draft an agreement, maybe we don't draft an agreement. That's a partnership, for better or worse. Um, so what happens is we would have a separate filing for this. So it's a Form 1065 federally. Say we make $200 at the end of the year. Hopefully not. Um, it's going to get reported on the partnership return. For 50-50 partners, we each report $100 of income on our own personal returns. Um, so it's a, what's known as a flow-through entity. Report the income at the top level, and then it flows down to us as individuals. Um, there's some pretty good health deductions um, and retirement plan options. And if you're doing this, I would echo it. It's, you should probably look into getting a partnership agreement because if something goes wrong, as it tends to go, um, you should have something that you can rely on. If someone wants to exit the business, you know, their buyout agreements, um, what are you contributing into the business, what does that mean? Um, you should have something in writing before you do this. Um, once again, your self-employment taxes, you're in business together, um, you're generating income as an employer and an employee, so you get hit with both sides of self-employment taxes. Um, but there's some simplicity involved with it as well. And you can also use the losses from the partnership to offset some of your other income on your own personal return. Um, an LLC. So this is done under state statute. So you can form an LLC in Massachusetts. Annual filing fee is around $500. It's pretty easy to do. Um, if I form an LLC and I'm the only owner, by default it's taxed similar to a sole proprietorship, which is reported on my individual tax return under what's known as a Schedule C. So there's no separate tax filing. It just attaches to my individual return. Um, if Don and I uh, formed an LLC, by default that would be a partnership. So it's kind of a hybrid entity in that it's simple to create like a sole proprietorship and partnership, but it gives you a little bit more legal protection. Um, and it's a little different under what state you form it under. Um, and then you can also do what's known as the 8832. That's a form where you can select other t types of classifications. Um, so we've seen people have an LLC, they elect to be a C Corp, and then I'll get onto this later, but then they make an S Corp election. So they've gone through three different uh, types of classifications. Uh, the formatting got a little weird here. Uh, <laughs> but a C Corp. Um, so it's a legal entity that's separate from its owners, so it's a standalone entity. Um, you file orders and corporations, you have annual filings, you have a board of directors, annual meetings, and you have stock. Um, Typically, the shareholders, directors, and officers are not legally responsible, but with everything, there's always a caveat. Um, but normally, there's some separation there. Uh, benefits of a C-Corp is there's no restriction on the type of shareholder. So you could have foreign investors, you could have limited investors, um, you could have multiple classes of stocks. So if you have you know, certain classes that you want to have preferential rights, you can make distinctions with the stock. Um, and the tax is done at the end of the level. Um, disadvantage of that is there's what's known as double taxation. You get taxed at the end of the level. And if you kick out a dividend to the stockholders, you get taxed again. Good news is that kind of got mitigated with the new tax reform because the corporate tax rate dropped to 21%. Um, so if you're comparing that to a flow through, the spread isn't as bad as it was historically. Uh, so an S Corp is a C Corp that makes an S election. Um, so what that means is that C Corp 
is now similar to a partnership in that it gets flow through treatment um, and the shareholders would get that income spread down to their personal returns. Um, it's restrictive on the ownership structure. So unlike a regular C Corp, the S Corp, you can't have a partnership invested in it, you can't have a corp invested in it, and you can't have non-resident alien shareholders invested in it. So it's a little restrictive on any foreign investments that you're getting um, and certain type of entities that you might want to have invested in it as well. Um, you can only have one class of stock as well. So if you want to have preferred shares and common stock and other various classifications, you can't do that under the S Corp. Um, there's one layer of taxation. Um, there's an issue in that you have to pay yourself reasonable compensation. So if I'm doing a job as an owner of this S Corp, um, what would I get paid to do that? If I was just an employee somewhere else, you have to do some you know, calculations to pay yourself a salary, so you're getting hit with the payroll taxes there. Um, but it's uh, a relatively common entity choice. Um, so now that you've formed your entity, what do you want to do? SS4 is what you fill out to get your federal ID number. Um, you can also do this online, it's a pretty quick process. Um, if you are a C Corp, considering the S Corp election, you want to do that. Um, based on the timing of that, that can either apply to the current year or the next year. Um, you want to file with the Secretary of the Commonwealth if you're forming in Massachusetts. Um, and Massachusetts also has an online platform for a lot of your tax needs. Uh, the website is called Mass Tax Connect. Uh, if you want to do sales tax filings, if you have, if you're, you know, a restaurant, you'd have your meals tax filings. Uh, you can pay your estimated taxes throughout the year on there. Um, any communication you have with the Mass Department of Revenue, you can respond directly to them online instead of writing letters or having to wait on hold for half hour plus. Um, so it's very convenient. So anyone who's starting a business, I would recommend forming an account under Mass Tax Connect. And this is kind of what the screen looks like once you log in. So you can see all your various types of um, filings down at the bottom. So this person has personal income tax return, uh, some sales tax filings that they have to do. Um, and it's a pretty user-friendly website. Uh, some other issues to think about. Um, if you've gone from historically just being a W-2 earner, so an employee of somewhere, you're probably used to having wage or, uh, taxes withheld all year long, both on the state and federally. When you go into business for yourself and say you're generating a profit, you're going to have to pay taxes on that. So you have to get set up in what's known estimated taxes, which means you're going to pay in quarterly throughout the year um, to true up your taxes. Um, certain situations, you definitely want to make sure you're doing this or else you can get hit with underpayment penalties for failing to pay in throughout the year and interest on that. So something you want to think about early. Um, if you have other filing requirements, uh, if you're granting stock, um, if you're paying self-employed or contractors, if you have employees, there's all different forms that have to be issued, 1099s, W-2s, 3921s. Um, so it's important to have a conversation with someone who knows the issues early, um, not after January 31st when a lot of the deadlines have already passed. Um, and some due dates to consider if your calendar year um, entity Partnerships and S-Corps are coming up in a couple weeks. And then C-Corps, sole proprietorships, um, which get reported on your individual return, those coming up in April. This year it's April 17th, I believe. And then LLC, it depends. What did you decide to do if you're an LLC or sole proprietorship, partnership, S-Corp, um, falls under those deadlines. So some tax saving opportunities. Uh, qualified small business stock. So this is stock that was originally issued after um, August 10th, 1993. Um, there's certain restrictions based on the size of the corporation when it was issued. Um, one point I want to make is that this is restrictive to just domestic U.S. C-Corps, so not partnerships, not sole proprietorships, it's just C-Corps. Um, at least 80% of the assets of it have to be used in active conduct of a trade or business. Essentially what they're saying is we don't want this to be a business and you have maybe half of your efforts to that business, another half are, you know, playing in the market, investing kind of a thing. They want it to be 
focused on the business. And I don't know why I keep doing that. <laughs> I don't know. I don't think so. Um, so if you hold that stock for five or more years, you have um, potential to exclude future gains on the sale. Um, it could be up to 100% of the gain, um, which is a pretty nice um, tax saving opportunity. So if you form this company, you own stock in it. Um, I think it's every time I touch the desk. Uh, <laughs> and then uh, later on, you sell it for a substantial gain. You get to exclude potentially a lot of that gain. Um, and you have to be the original issuer, which means you can't buy it from someone else who acquired the stock directly from the company. Another big one we're seeing more and more of is the R&D credit. Um, so if you're coming up with a innovative idea and there's some um, potential that it may not pan out as you expect it to, um, and you're investing heavily in this technology or this idea or this process, uh, you might qualify for an R&D credit. Um, it's a percentage of the expenses that you put into this effort and you can get it as a credit. Um, historically, what was happening is a, large, a lot of large companies were benefiting from this because it was a credit against your um, income taxes. So a lot of startups weren't generating revenue necessarily or they weren't turning a profit yet. So they never really got any benefit out of the R&D credit. So what they did recently is they started allowing this to be taken against your payroll taxes. So say you have an idea it's not really flushed out yet. Um, you get a large influx of capital into the company. You really develop this idea. Um, those expenses are something you should be considering for this credit because you can get a pretty nice tax saving opportunity. Um, even if you're not generating income yet, it can help reduce your payroll taxes. Um, so something to keep in mind. And now Dawn is going to grace you with her presence to talk about equity comp. <laughs> okay. So, as Eileen said earlier, cash is king with a startup, right? So, one of the ways that a lot of startups will compensate their employees is through the equity compensation. So, usually there are cash limitations on the startups and it's also a way of aligning the incentives of the founders and the employees with the incentives of the startup which is to grow the value of the, of the firm and the company as a whole so two of the most common forms that we typically see from startups are stock grants or restricted stock units uh, these are typically stock awards they're actual shares and they're typically awarded subject to a vesting schedule, which is vesting over a period of time or vesting based upon performance requirements, meeting certain revenue targets or developing partnerships, things of that nature. Uh, stock grants are taxed to the individual as compensation when they vest. So when the actual shares are vested is when the individual would, will be taxed as ordinary income. There is an election under the IRS code referred to as an 83B election. And this election will allow you to elect to be taxed on those shares on the date of grant rather than on the date of vesting. So if the fair market value of the stock is low or expected to be lower than when it vests, say it's a four or five year vesting period, it would allow you to pay tax on a smaller value. The risk is that the value does not increase, but typically at the very early stages of a company, it has a very small value to begin with, so your, your risk is pretty low. The uh, 83B election must be filed within 30 days from the data grant, so that is one thing you need to be aware of and you want to stay on top of. It's a very limited period of time that you have that option, and once that 30 days goes by, it's lost. Under the new Tax Act, there is a new 83I election. I am not going to spend that much time on it other than just to make you aware that it is out there. Uh, this uh, option will allow you to elect to defer taxes up to a five-year period based on varying triggering events. 
It's for certain qualified stock, and it's for certain eligible corporations. And that's where I'm not going to get into the detail is what a, a qualified stock is for an eligible corporation. Other than letting you know that one requirement to be an eligible corporation is that at least 80% of full-time employees are receiving the grants or awards. And that's the reason I'm not going to get into too much detail. Uh, the other most common measure we see for stock compensation is stock options. So stock options are options to purchase stock in a company. It's at a fixed or defined exercise price, and it's for a fixed period of time. Typically, it's a 10-year period. These also typically vest over time. Some immediate vesting is possible, but you typically see a vesting period of three to five years, and they also can be performance-based vesting. So stock options are either a non-qualified stock option or an incentive stock option. So non-qualified stock options will be taxed to the individual when they exercise the option. And they'll be taxed as compensation on the difference between the fair market value of the stock on the date that they choose to exercise and the amount that they actually pay, which is the exercise price. So for example, you're awarded an option the fair market value of that option and the exercise price is one dollar. Say five years from that date you're fully vested and you decide to exercise and the fair value is five dollars. So you pay one dollar, you receive stock worth five dollars, you will be taxed on four dollars as compensation at the time of exercise. Subsequently when those shares are sold there'll be a capital gain or loss calculation based on the fair market value on the date sold and the fair market value from the date you exercise. An incentive stock option, on the other hand, is not taxed. It's not taxed upon the grant date and it's not taxed upon the exercise date. So you can defer the tax until you actually sell the shares, provided that if you do exercise those shares, you have to at least hold them for one year from the exercise date and two years from the original grant date in order to maintain the incentive stock option status. There is, however, an AMT calculation upon the exercise. So although the actual exercise does not result in a compensation tax, there is an AMT minimum alternative minimum tax calculation. So higher income tax bracket taxpayers may find themselves paying a tax upon the exercise. So how do you qualify for an ISO? You have to be a corporation. Only a corporation can issue ISOs, a partnership, an LLC. They cannot issue ISOs. They can issue stock options, but they would be considered non-qualified stock options. ISOs can only be issued to employees and certain board members that meet the definition of employee. So any stock options issued to consultants or uh, external parties or certain board members will only qualify as a non-qualified stock option. They must be issued under a written plan. There must be a written stock option plan which authorizes how many units will be authorized under the plan. And each additional agreement or award in, on an individual basis must also be documented in writing. They must have an exercise period of no more than 10 years and they need to forfeit upon termination of the individual employee unless they exercise within 90 days. There's a limitation of $100,000 vesting per year. That's per individual. So you can issue various options to an individual employee, but cumulatively, they cannot exceed a vesting of $100,000 in exercise value per year. If you do, the ones in excess will be treated as non-qualified stock options. The first 100 would meet the treatment for the ISO. They're restricted upon transfer, and one of the most important things is that the exercise price cannot be less than the fair market value on the date of the grant. And that leads us to the 409A. So Code Section 409A under the Internal Revenue Code is a non-qualified deferred compensation tax, and typically options are exempt from code section 409A and that is only if the exercise price is not less than the fair market value of the stock on the date of grant. If on the date of grant 
the exercise price is less than the fair market value of the stock, then it is considered a discount and it is considered non-qualified deferred compensation. That will result in an immediate tax to the employee uh, based upon the value of the options plus a 20% penalty plus interest. So how do you avoid code section 409A tax is by obtaining what you'll hear referred to often as the 409A valuation. And that is your formal valuation of the company's stock value. And you want to obtain that prior to awarding your options to your employees so that you ensure you're not under the fair market value on the issuance date. These are typically prepared by valuation specialists. Uh, it is one of the expenses that most companies do not want to incur. And it is one I would highly recommend if you are issuing options that you do. Uh, typically what you would see is a company would obtain a 409A valuation on an annual basis and they would issue options throughout the year. That generally is an acceptable process. However, if there is a significant event or activity that occurs during the year, you may want to get a second one. If you, it will impact the value of the company before you're awarding any new options. If you're not issuing new options, you can get through with your valuation until the subsequent year. Yeah, back to Robert. So multi-state tax issues. I'll start this off with the uh, little bit of a crux on the tax climate. Every state wants to get more and more money. Every state's looking for a way to get the money out of you. So you want to be aware of some potential um, ways that you may fall into other states taxing authorities so that you're not getting hit with a notice or assessment from another state and you're completely blindsided to penalties and interest and all sorts of other issues that you thought you were exempt from. Um, so you operate in multiple states, do you have um, inventory, employees, um, are you renting offices in another state, uh, are you just selling services or maybe a, a tangible product to another state. Um, and do you think this only applies to large companies? You know, are you exempt from any potential issues because you think you're flying under the radar? Um, you'd be surprised. So the first thing we're going to talk about is nexus. This is a word. If you talk to a CPA or an accountant, you'll hear this often. This is just referring to the level of involvement you have with that state. Um, so you have to have some sort of nexus before you start talking about your income taxes or your sales taxes. Um, and these are some. Um, very exciting legal lease um, sections down here. If you find yourself struggling to sleep at night, I'd recommend giving them a read. Um, so the first thing we'll talk about is your physical presence. So this is a type of nexus. Uh, so if you have property in the state, you know, if you have a warehouse there, if you're renting an office space there, if you buy a building there, you have a physical object in that state, uh, or if you have employees there. Um, one thing that we see more and more of is the click-through nexus. This is called the Amazon law. Um, it's essentially saying that you're soliciting sales uh, through a website of a company that has a physical presence or some sort of nexus there, and they're making the connection back to you. So although you don't have a physical location there, you're engaging with another party who does. Um, typically, how this happens is you're advertising on this website, they have a physical presence there. Maybe you're giving them a commission or some kind of kickback um, on that sale, and then that's attributing you as if you were there. Um, so you think about a, someone selling on Amazon. Um, they're selling through Amazon. They're advertising on Amazon. Amazon's in pretty much every state by now. Um, so you may be connected um, depending upon who you're selling to. Uh, economic nexus. Um, so if you're doing a certain level of sales or revenue, um, you may have nexus through this. This is something that is currently um, being debated on the sales tax side. And I'll get to that in a bit. Uh, pass through nexus. So if you know Don and I's partnership really takes off, and the partnership has nexus in all these states, Don and I have uh, nexus uh, through our ownership in this company. And then uh, your factor present nexus. nexus. So most states will determine your tax by apportioning your income um, if you're operating in multiple states. So they look at you know your total 
payroll, your total rent, your total property in this state compared to overall, and they'll do some sort of apportionment um, to attribute some of your income there. Um, so there's different thresholds of nexus which subject you to different levels of tax. Uh, typically your sales and use tax is the first um, tax that you're subject to. Uh, there's some sort of physical presence or click-through nexus. Um, and what's going on right now in South Dakota, there's a court case going on through Wayfair and Overstock and what they're trying to do is institute a uh, threshold of sales that will bring you in, which is an economic nexus. So they're saying, hey, if you do over $100,000 worth of sales in this state, you're now subject to sales tax without needing a physical presence there, um, which is contrary to Quill, which is the former court case, which said that you needed to have some sort of physical presence. Um, and the states are saying, hey, it's internet age. Everyone's doing everything online. Why do they need to be here? It should be based on sales. Um, so the Supreme Court's expected to hear that in April, and then all the CPAs in the world will be scrambling to make sure that the clients are okay on this side. So something to be aware of. Um, every state would want to follow that to try to get more money brought in, and um, there will be different thresholds most likely across the different states. South Dakota isn't the only one who's starting to implement this. Uh, there's at least a handful of other states that have started to go, on this, go this route. Um, so all sorts of other taxes, your income tax, um, withholdings for um, employees, um, franchise taxes, gross receipts tax, um, and your income tax. Um, income tax is probably the other one that you care about the most. Um, there's typically a higher level of engagement in the states. Um, you have to kind of go beyond just soliciting sales there. It has to be a little bit more involved. There's some uh, safe harbor requirements that if you fall within those parameters, you're not victim or shouldn't say victim, but uh, brought in for income tax filing yet. And I'll say that this is very tricky and there's a lot of planning involved here. Um, so you'll most likely have questions and it's very specific. So if anyone gives you an off the cuff answer, there's usually something that hasn't been discussed yet that needs to be hammered out a little bit further. Um, so if you have Nexus, now what do you have to do? talked about this a little bit before, you're going to apportion your income across various states um, to determine what income is attributed there. Uh, some other state taxes to think about, uh, so you talked about your sales and use tax. Um, there's certain types of property that are exempt. Most states will exempt it if it's a raw good that's going to be resold again. So what they're saying is we're not going to charge you sales tax on the initial purchase of something because it's just going to get subsequently sold again and then they're going to collect sales tax on the end good. So instead of getting hit at each level of the process, they'll wait. Um, if you're selling raw goods or something that's in the, the process of that, um, you'd want to get a uh, reseller certificate from the person who's buying that from you so you have that for your own records. Um, sales tax is not a cost to you, it's a cost to the person purchasing it from you. You're going to charge them and then you're going to have to remit it on their behalf. Um, some services will be taxed in some states. Um, it's one of those things, each state does things a little bit differently because if they were all consistent that would be too easy. Um, so generally exempt, but sometimes they are. And software is a little bit all over the place. Um, depending on the type of software and what you're doing with it. Um, some other things to think about, there's a million other taxes out there. I used to uh, do monthly work for a hotel based on um, one of the islands. And they had meals tax, occupancy tax, beverage tax, property taxes, tourism taxes. They had like a beach preservation tax because they were on the beach. Um, so if you're establishing a location somewhere, you should look into any potential other taxes um, and something that might be particular to your business. Um, some states will have city and county taxes as well. So if I haven't been a dead horse yet, there's a lot of taxes out there. So it's best to be aware of what's going on early. So now we're going to talk about uh, the recent tax updates a little bit. Uh, so that went into effect, well, signed into law in December. Uh, most changes start 1-1 of 18. Um, 
but some actually did start in 17. Um, so some depreciation rules changed um, on the individual side. There are some changes as well that I won't touch on. Um, the beauty in all of this is that every state starts with their own version of federal taxable income and then makes adjustments to determine the state tax. So now when you change the initial point of that whole calculation, all the states have to decide what they want to do next. Um, some states automatically conform to the new federal taxation um, guidelines. Some have to bring them into law and some are kind of a mixed bag. So every state's trying to figure out what they want to do next um, and managing the economic impact of the reform on their own state level. Um, so the one thing that you maybe have heard from some friends is this new 20% qualified business deduction. Um, so for your flow through entities is what I'll refer to them as. So your S corps, your partnerships, your schedule C's, which is your sole proprietorships or your LLC's where you're the only owner um, or your schedule E's, which is rental property. Um, those all get taxed on your individual return and certain types of income may be eligible for a 20% deduction against the income. Um, there is a threshold that if you're under, so the 157,000 um, and the 315,000, um, it's a pretty easier, I wouldn't say it's not easy, but it's an easier calculation. You'll most likely qualify for this 20% deduction. Um, if your income is over that, it gets a little bit more tricky uh, they start taking into account the wages being paid out of the business. Um, and there's also more restrictions on to the type of businesses that qualify. What they're trying to do is give a deduction for uh, businesses that are actually making a product. So the professional services companies aren't um, as easily qualified for this 20% deduction. They specifically say accountants, so bad for me. Um, and they specifically say some financial services industries and lawyers. Um, so they're trying to allow this for people who are making a product rather than people who are providing a service with their, you know, skill sets. Um, and the point of this 20% deduction is they were trying to bring the flow through benefit back um, to get on par with the new reduced corporate rate. So the corporate rate dropped from 35% to 21%. So all the flow throughs were saying, hey, we've enjoyed this one level of taxation. Um, but the individual tax rate can go up to almost 40%. Uh, so they're saying, you know, maybe I want to think about being a C Corp. I get hit with a double taxation, but I might end up in a better spot. Um, so that's why they implemented this. Um, if you do take the 20% deduction, it makes you a little bit more susceptible for um, some penalties on your return. So it's something that you want to be pretty confident with um, if you're taking this. So this will be for returns next filing season, so starting 118. So the joy in all of this is that they wrote a tax law in a little bit rushed, um, and everyone's trying to figure out what specific businesses really qualify for this, and we're still waiting for some more guidance. So all I can tell you is the general theme of what we're seeing, um, and hopefully we'll have some more formal guidance to avoid these penalties by the time we're filing next year. So as I mentioned, the corporate tax rate went down to 21%. Um, it was a progressive rate before that topped out at 35%. It was pretty easy to get into the 35% bracket. Um, AMT and DPAD were repealed. So alternative minimum tax, there's no more calculation for that. Um, that's pretty much just, hey, you have your regular taxable income calc. We're going to tweak it a little bit just to make sure you're paying enough in with some modifications. So that's what AMT was. That's gone. Uh, the domestic production activity deduction is repealed. Um, and NOLs, so net operating losses. So if you've historically lost money and you've been carrying it forward to future years to offset future income, the way that's done um, will also change a bit. So starting with any losses incurred in 18, those losses will be limited to 80%. So you could have a bunch of losses historically that you were expecting to you know, offset future income and you might still end up paying some tax even though you have larger losses. Um, and you'll no longer be able to carry those losses back, it'll just be carrying them forward. 
So a lot of things about depreciation that I won't bore you with too much. Just know that it got more friendly for you. Um, so 179 expensing is just immediately expensing of qualified assets. Um, it increased the amount of assets that you're able to do under this. Before it was a half million, now it's a million. Um, and there's some new full expensing of assets, so not even depreciating, but full expensing of them. Um, and that actually went into effect September 27th of 2017. So if you bought a bunch of assets in the last quarter of 2017 and you haven't filed your taxes yet, or if you have um, and want to think about amending, you might have some uh, big deductions that you missed out on. Uh, there's going to be a cap on business interest limitations. Um, what they're trying to do is take away some of the benefit of raising money through loans and kind of make it a little bit on par with equity financing. Um, so it's going to be capped at 30% of your adjusted taxable income. So if you have a highly, highly leveraged company with some big interest deductions, it's going to be capped at a certain amount, which you'll be able to carry forward. Um, and it doesn't apply to electing real property trades or businesses. Um, or car dealerships with floor interest plans. So if you have some real estate companies, um, some large interest deductions, they would elect an alternative method of depreciation, which would depreciate their assets over a longer life. So there's some calculations you'd wanna do to determine what's best for you in that situation. Um, if anyone heard of that Bruins case last year, um, what they were saying is they were getting meals before all the games and it was a qualified business expense because it was connected with their service as employees of the Bruins and they were able to get a 100% deduction for the meals. That's really simply how I'll put it. There's more complications than that. Um, this new law would eliminate that and they would cap the deduction at 50%. Um, this hits home more on the uh, startup scene where they're counting on more fringe benefits um, so they want to supply meals on site for their employees the rules around that are a lot harder to get a hundred percent deduction on those meals um, and entertainment is now very very hard to get any deduction for um, good news is cash method of accounting the thresholds for that increased um, there were smaller thresholds before where you'd have to do accrual method of accounting, which is a little bit more complicated than just saying, hey, I got money or hey, I paid money. It's timing, um, a little bit more cumbersome on the accounting side. So they increase the thresholds until you have to do that. And there's this new paid family and medical leave tax credit. So certain eligible employers um, might receive a credit uh, for paying their employees um, while they're out on medical leave. Uh, there's a lot of restrictions on that and um, it's just something to think about and maybe have a conversation if you're potentially eligible for that. So some international changes. Um, the overall theme was that we're supposed to move to more of a territorial system of taxation. So U.S. was taxed on the U.S rather than a worldwide system where you're getting tax credits for double taxation. Um, that's the overall theme. Like with anything, there's caveats to that. Um, so the foreign source dividends. So if you have a subsidiary in another company, it's abroad and it's paying a dividend back to the um, US company, there's supposed to be um, some exclusion for that dividend income. Um, there's a new foreign derived intangible income tax calculation which has to be done. So this is for US uh, C Corps. This is an incentive. So what they're saying is we're going to do this complicated calculation to figure out what in income is attributed to intangible uh, assets and the sales associated with that that are being held in the US but are producing income worldwide. Um, so the tax on that income will be at a lower rate. So 13 a little over 13% as opposed to the 35%. So this is an incentive for your companies to hold their intangible assets in the U.S. Um, so if you heard about you know, Apple and how they had all these intangible assets over in Ireland and they were paying like no tax, the U.S. is trying to incentivize companies to hold those assets here. 
And on the flip side is they're pen punishing um, some companies that still continue to hold their intangible assets overseas um, in a corporation. So there's this new guilty tax. Um, and this is going to be for controlled foreign corporations. So there's a bit of a complicated calculation to figure out if that's what the case is. And um, essentially what they're saying is we want to make sure you're paying uh, taxes on the earnings on these intangibles overseas. Um, there's mandatory repa repatriation that's going into effect this April. Um, so that was nice. We got the new tax law in December. There's this calculation that has to be done by April. Um, so what they're saying is, hey, all that money that you've been holding overseas, we're going to have a deemed repatriation of that um, taxed at 15.5% for cash or cash equivalents or 8% for liquid assets. Um, it's a deemed repatriation. It doesn't matter if you bring the money back or not. Um, so this is something that has to be done by this April. Um, there's an election that you can do to defer that tax over eight years. So it's something that you would definitely want to look into if you find yourself in this situation. Uh, new partnership audit rules. Um, so a little bit of history about IRS audits and the partnership audit um, regimen. Um, you have a partnership, say it's Don and I and everyone in this room, we're all in a partnership. The IRS would have to go audit that partnership and then go down to all the individual partners in that partnership to figure out what the ramifications were. So you think about the IRS and their budget and what they want to do with their time. They weren't doing a lot of these audits because it was just way too timely and costly to do them. Um, so partnerships were kind of flying under the radar for a lot of audits. Um, so what they're going to do now is they're going to say, hey, we'll tax you at the partner level or the partnership level and it's up to the partnership to figure out what they want to do and collect that money from all the partners. So that's their way of kind of shortening the process of that. Um, the good news is there's a way to elect out of this treatment. Um, so it's only for certain qualified partnerships. Uh, yep, so you have to have 100 partners or less it's an annual election, um, and all the it's restrictive as to what types of partners you can have in the partnership. Um, so S corps, or states, or upper tiered partnerships can be partners in this. Uh, so it's restrictive on that. Um, so a lot of partnerships are amending their partnership agreements as to what types of partners they can allow. Um, to try to make sure that they can elect out of this new partnership treatment, partnership audit treatment. Um, and you want to also include who your partnership representative is in the case of an audit. Otherwise, the audit ha or the IRS has the ability to just name one on behalf of you. So you want to have that in the partnership document documents. And that was that. And that's Don and I's contact information. There you go. That was me last week. <laughs> so three of us will take questions. Yep. They haven't thought about their taxes at all. <laughs> Um, so they either haven't thought about what type of entity they want to be, um, they haven't registered with the Commonwealth yet, um, maybe they're a partnership, they haven't gotten all the legal documents in place to really ensure the longevity of that agreement, um, they haven't thought about all the different other taxes they may be subject to, um, or if they have the benefit of being really profitable right off the bat, they haven't thought about paying any estimates. Um, Normally what happens is that all their money's just commingled in their personal bank account and their books are a mess. And then you're saying, I re what really happened during the year? And they're like, well, I think I made money. So. Right. Thank you. 
Right. Mm-hmm. You would imagine, but it's taxes we're talking about. <laughs> uh, so the question was about software as a service, um, and say you're implementing it for a company that's headquartered, maybe it's internationally, um, but the benefits being spread across all their offices and locations across you know the U.S. maybe worldwide. How do you determine sales tax on that? Um, I believe the principle is you're supposed to go to the headquarters, but with software, it's also a lot more complicated because software sometimes is exempt from sales tax, other times it's subject to sales tax, um, and every state has different rules about how they determine that. So software, when you said that, I was starting laughing because I was like, this is not something that I can give you a hard and fast rule about. So what are the parameters that are applied? Are you saying most of the software? Mm-hmm. So one thing I'll look at is, you know, is this software that's kind of out of the box and it's more of a product that you're selling to them? Or is this something where you have to go, you know, there's an implementation period and it's more of a service where you're going there and getting them set up on that. So the service would be less prone to the sales taxes, more providing the service versus, you know, it's a product that you're selling out of the box. But again, every state does things a little bit differently because they like to make sure I am gainfully employed, I guess. <laughs> So the question is, um, I talked about outsourcing as a solution and um, kind of consolidating, um, consolidating positions. And I think one of the factors that outsourcing can provide and um, in the right, you know, for the right circumstances is that many organizations, like our organization, has bookkeeping levels all the way up to controllership level responsibilities so that um, different tasks are assigned to the appropriate level person with a reviewer in place. And so within, within organizations, they'll sometimes say, well, we need to have segregation of duties, so we need to have two people, we need to hire two people. Well, that's hiring two full bodies, or perhaps a part-time you know, part person, which is um, kind of harder to do today. Um, and then you have your overhead that goes along with the people, the space that goes along with the people, the turnover that goes along with the people. So, so basically if you, if, if outsourcing is something that you're evaluating, um, you'd certainly want to see what the spectrum of services an organization does provide. So the question was, uh, are there any downside to doing cash basis accounting versus accrual? Um, one thing I would say is, what does your net income look like, cash versus accrual? Um, sometimes you get the ability to accelerate expenses on the accrual basis um, or defer income on the accrual basis. So maybe you received cash for something, but you haven't provided all the work for it yet. Accrual, maybe you can defer some of that income until you've you know, fulfilled all the services. Um, a lot of that's a timing difference, though. Maybe you don't have it this year. Next year, you know, you're the opposite. Uh, so, right. Yep. Um, there aren't a lot of other indirect consequences that I can really think of, like the R&D credit and stuff like that, when it really fall into place. Um, those are more restrictive on entity type and you know, meeting all the criteria to qualify for it. But as far as method of accounting, not so much. Um, if you're prepared. Mm -hmm. um, one thing I'll say is that sometimes it gets complicated if you're keeping all your books on the accrual basis for financial statement purposes. So if you're pitching to VCs or someone and they want to see financials and they want them you know, audited and they're under accrual basis, 
and then you're keeping a complete separate set of books for cash basis for your tax return. Sometimes that's a little bit more burdensome. There are softwares out there that can do both of it, you know, simultaneously, but you still, you know, gets a little bit more complicated and sometimes you just want to keep apples to apples. Um, stuff like that. So uh, some, uh, for the, some say that for the startup, uh, this is a matter between the, we call for the C-Core, S-Core, stop, like you said, C-Core is better because you have low uh, freedom for the investor and also you're not going to get any income for the site for a while. So they said it's better to incorporate at the C-Core rather than the S-Core. Mm -hmm. so so the question was about startups, the advantages of the C-Corp versus the S-Corp. Um, a lot of startups do go the C-Corp route because they're not getting hit with the corporate taxation. Um, there's also the qualified small business stock. So the potential down the line, if they sell that stock, they can get excluded. Um, and the main one is the ease of access for equity investment into a C-Corp. Um, there's a lot less restrictions. Uh, plus, if you want to have different types of stock, so you, know, you want to have your preferred shares, and different levels, you can do that with a C Corp. Um, so for a pure income tax standpoint, S Corp is normally more beneficial. With the new tax law, there's certain, uh, certain situations where the C Corp still might be more advantageous, but more from a startup, you know, issuing stock, raising funds, um, the qualified small business stock, some all that kind of falls into play to be advantageous for the C Corp. Anything else? Is that it? Nothing online? <laughs> All right.